So before I started the recording, I was saying, describing the challenges of the online lab and what I had tried in Physics 4A last semester and didn't work <laughs> and what I'm trying this semester. And um, this is the page in the week one module laying out the lab overview for this semester. And one of the things that I'm going to do this semester to try to hopefully have a successful lab section is to min, uh, limit the number of labs. And this uh, mainly has to do with the amount of time it just takes for a kind of a cycle of feedback. Uh, once you complete lab activity, I want you to be able to turn in something kind of preliminary to get feedback and then, um, and then turning something that's final. And um, so I think I say all that in this paragraph, so I don't need to say it again. Uh, one aspect that uh, I want to kind of uh, ha have you start thinking about and prepare for is that you are going to be working in groups. And um, unlike in face-to-face -face lab, I can actually see you working together in group. So what I'm going to have you do is um, turn in one lab report for the group. So each group will have uh, most of the time two people in it. Um, I, I think that'll work. And I will consider exception in case of exceptions group of three, but I think a two people group will work out best. And so those two lab partners will work together. And between the two of you, you will turn in only one lab report. So um, around the beginning of next week, we will start forming groups. So I want you to just uh, start thinking about that. Um, but with each lab, I'm planning out, you can kind of see in the dates here, I'm planning out about two to three weeks. So you will have, um, you will have some time. Uh, I'm hoping, one of the things I'm hoping to avoid doing is uh, having this be a rushed thing. So um, now, what I want you to demonstrate today is how the logistics of all this will work out. One of the things that didn't work out so well last semester with the Physics 4A was trying to do lab activities based on simulation. And um, I think what I underestimated then was just uh, how, much, um, um, how much technical complications there can be with the simulations. Uh, one second, let me just uh, mute the chime. You might not be hearing the chime, but I hear it and it's uh, kind of distracting to me. So let me uncheck that. Um, so, um, so yeah, with the simulation, it just added a layer of, um, layer of uh, challenges and obstacles that, um, that just made the things harder. So what I'm trying to do this semester is um, I'm going to try not to use simulations as much as possible. So instead of simulation, what I'm going to have are recorded videos. And these will be recorded with some observation or measurement in mind so that you can actually make measurements uh, based on the videos you will watch. And, um, and the instruction will kind of guide you through that. And what I want you to demonstrate with the with the videos I have prepared for today is kind of give you a sense of how this might work out. So um, these are the videos that are linked from the announcement that I posted this morning. Uh, I'm going to uh, play from a file that's uh, on my computer because I'm on a kind of limited bandwidth. Let me uh, reshare my desktop with um, optimized uh, uh, for sharing a video clip. Um, I hope I'm still sharing the right screen. Uh, if I'm not sharing the screen where my mouse is moving right now, please tell me. <laughs> no one's telling me, so good. <laughs> okay, so I'm. Um, let, let me play from this file here. The first one is the Stirling engine demonstration. This video here, it's about, well, you can see the minutes here, five minutes, uh, 37 seconds. So let me play that and then um, kind of comment on what kind of things I can imagine you doing if this is part of a uh, lab activity. In this video, we will demonstrate the working model of a Stirling engine. We light it up with a match. The guessing Stirling engine moves between two pistons, one hot and one cold. The alcohol lamp hits the hot end. 
as the wheel turns, the volumes of these two pistons change, right? Now the hot end is at maximum volume, now the cold end is at maximum volume. And as the gas moves between these two pistons, it heats and it cools. And this uh, becomes the basis of the engine cycle. Right now the engine is working and it's turning. Uh, I have a IR thermometer with which I'm trying to measure the temperature of different parts of the engine. I don't know if I entirely trust this number, but it says the hot end is at about 100 degrees C and the cold end is at about the room temperature, 24 degrees C. Um, I was trying it with a few different places and I was getting inconsistent readings. I don't know how much confidence I have in the numbers, but the hot end is somewhere around 100 degrees C, uh, give or take 20 or 30 degrees C or so. Okay, blew out the alcohol lamp, but the engine will continue to run while the hot piston remains hot. But as with the turning engine, it eventually cools down enough that the engine no more, no longer works. And this is where I wasn't quite trusting the numbers. I think it's uh, cooler than 90 degrees C. Uh, what I need, really need to be able to do is measure the temperature of the air inside, but the IR thermometer doesn't work that way. Now, let me cut forward to the part of the video where I illustrate the real utility of a heat engine. Heat engine is a device that turns flow of heat, thermal energy, into mechanical energy. And one way we can use that mechanical energy is to generate electrical energy. And this device is set up to do that. I just connected the axle with um, a small generator, which is hooked up to uh, LED light. So I turned on the engine again and it'll take a few seconds for the hot end to warm up and once it's warmed up enough we will run the engine and see what kind of output we get. Alright, uh, not quite hot enough yet, a little bit more. Also, I was turning it in the wrong direction. I don't know if that matters. All right, so when the engine is turning slowly, the generator doesn't generate high enough voltage to turn the LED on. But as you watch this work, as the engine fully warms up and it's turning faster, it produces now voltage high enough to actually turn on the LED. And it's quite pretty. It's a model of um, how, how heat engines are used. The most common use of a heat engine is to generate electrical energy in the form of steam turbines and other things um, and once it's a, once the energy is turned into electrical form then there are many things we can do with that one of which is to produce a visible light to light our form and what else <laughs> so uh, this is a demo of a working engine sterling engine it's not the most common form of practical engine you will find but it's a very useful uh, demo tool because it's a, unlike an internal combustion engine, there are complicated parts and timing issues to worry about for the combustion part. And the, the externally applied heat is very easy to see. And this particular model is made with a transparent part, which allows you to see the changes in the volumes and all that. All right, um, I think that's enough of the engine to demonstrate. I turned it off here, 
and I'll wrap up this video here. Thank oh, yeah. stopped it a little bit early, but it's fine. So this one, it's closer to a video of um, um, lecture demo than a laboratory apparatus. So the level of detailed analysis you can do is probably limited here, but one piece of information you get are the temperatures. And as you will see in about two weeks, uh, that's enough to start doing some estimates of what the expected efficiencies are. If it's uh, something called the Carnot engine, which is the most ideal possible cycle, or um, in about a couple of weeks, you will see the <laughs> analysis of Stirling cycle. But uh, so in this video, you can see the actual measurements of temperatures, and uh, that can be enough to do simple estimates. So this will, by itself wouldn't be a complete lab because it's uh, kind of limited. You know, this is a turnkey device, and you just uh, <laughs> get some limited thing out of that. So it's more of a lecture demo than a laboratory apparatus. But even with this, you can do some level of analysis based on the information that I took care to include into the video. Let me show you the next clip, which is closer to the types of video clips that you will see. Um, there should be like a dozen or more like the next one. And I think with that, you can do something that's quite close to what you would be doing in in-person lab if um, you're one of those students who, you know, in a five-person group, you don't want to touch anything. You just want to watch your <laughs> classmate to do it. And it'll work out at least similar to that. So let's watch that video so that you can at least imagine what that would look like. This is a sample demonstration of a heat engine apparatus. First, uh, let me demonstrate the, the thermal reservoirs using this uh, thermometer. Uh, we have a cold reservoir containing ice water, and you can see that it's cold. Um, the given long enough time, thermometer should go down to zero degrees C, but that takes long. We'll take it out here at around two degrees or so. And the other thermal reservoir we have is the tap water. It's just the room temperature. You can see that it's about 20 degrees or so. And, and there is actually a third thermal reservoir, which is my body heat. Using that, I can raise the temperature of something a little bit higher than 20 degrees, around 30 degrees or so. Now this uh, heat engine apparatus comes in two parts. It has the piston and the aluminum can connected by this tube. The piston part has the moving parts. It has the um, piston which moves up and down and the airflow into piston is controlled by these two valves. It can be open or closed. So if I close both of them and then try to pull out the piston, it won't because it's kind of vacuum in there. Normally, we will have aluminum can connected to one of those connections and have the valve open. Now, this time when I pull the piston, it'll come out a little bit, but when I let go, it gets pulled back in because increasing the volume lowers the pressure. So open the valve and now the air can freely flow in. That's how we can control the starting amount of gas. Now, finally, there is a way we can apply a known amount of pressure using these weights. I have a 100 gram mass, put it on top, that will apply a known amount of additional pressure above atmospheric pressure and above the amount of pressure that the weight of the piston normally does. So this is the initial setup. There's some amount of pressure applying on the gas. There's some fixed amount of gas in the thing. And now we can use this setup to illustrate ideal gas law. When I put this aluminum can into the cold reservoir that lowers the temperature, so according to ideal gas law, PV equals NKT, if the pressure remains the same while temperature decreases, the volume will go down. 
Now we have a separate video. Let me uh, repeat this part. We have a separate video that's uh, taken from a 90 degree angle, which will allow you to read off how much the volume was changing. So let me just uh, rewind this part and show you the second view of the video on the right hand side here. Here we go. And you can read those uh, marks. Um, yeah. And there's uh, enough information in this video to actually get a measurement of how much volume changed. And if we put the can in the tap water, the volume increases. Now, you will see that it doesn't come back to the exact same spot where it used to be. It's because the gas leaks a little from this piston. So uh, this uh, experimental setup was its more of a lecture demo than a precision measurement type. Now, if I apply my body heat, to heat up the aluminum cam a little bit more, the volume actually even increases a little bit. And finally, if I remove the additional mass at the top, that decreases the pressure. So given the same temperature, volume increases. So this is how we will do some of the online lab. Let me just repeat the measurements here so that you can get a good look at the changes in the changing values. So for our online lab, we will have a series of videos like this. And you can make your observation and measurement using the videos that I will make available. And we will use some of our synchronous lab meeting time on the Zoom to um, make additional measurements. This is the kind of thing happens all the time in the lab. You do your first measurement, and then you do some calculation and analysis. Then you figure out, oh, I didn't have this necessary information. So uh, I'll be physically in the lab uh, taking your requests and uh, showing you additional observations and measurements. So I think that's everything. Thank you for watching this video, and I will see you in the lab. So well, I guess I already said that in the video what I was going to say now, that um, that's uh, um, what the, um, so that's uh, um, what I hope to use the synchronous meeting time for. So all the videos, you know, I showed this now, but uh, when the lab instructions are available, they will be available in a way that's, um, that you can access it on your own time. The synchronous net lab meeting time will be for lab follow-up, uh, where so based on the information that's available, you did your calculation analysis, and maybe you feel like there's some missing information, or some, or maybe it's just something you want to check out out of curiosity, and the lab meeting time will be the time when I can um, fulfill those requests. You tell me what you want me to show you, and, and I'm, I'll be in the lab, and I can show you. I can uh, perform whatever observation. So um, I haven't tried this before, so I don't know if it's going to work, but it's at least not something I've tried before and didn't work. So um, uh, let me uh, change my screen share setting a little bit so that I uh, think uh, when I have optimized the screen sharing for video clip, it's a bit um, uses more bandwidth. So just change the screen sharing. Uh, so I don't know if it makes a difference. So that's the lab plan. Now, for those synchronous meeting times when I'm doing the lab follow-up, as in I'm answering, not answering questions, um, much the right term. Um, when I'm doing those additional measurements that people request, those won't be recorded because it kind of goes to um, what I put in this announcement. Whether a session is recorded or not, it has to do with, is it going to be relevant to people who aren't there to interact? And for the lab follow-up, I don't think it will be relevant because um, it's basically relevant to people who are asking, making the request, and it's relevant to people who are able to ask clarifying questions at the top moment. 
So anyone who might be able to watch the video later, I don't think it'll be relevant to them. So I won't record it in the first place. So um, that won't be every Wednesday. It'll be, there will be basically maybe five Wednesdays in the semester when we do that because it's uh, basically the lab follow-up. The initial set of data and observations will be available in a format like these videos. So um, yeah, so that's the lab format. Um, oh wow, did I actually keep to my time, 30 minutes? <laughs> that will be some something new. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, what I wanted to demonstrate, demonstration and plan for online labs this semester. So um, uh, in an earlier announcement, there was a, a kind of a photo of some of the apparatus that we'll be using. Where was that? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, some, um, some of these, well, not some, all of these equipment will definitely be used throughout the semester. Um, I might be able to think of some additional ones. Um, so this is basically the thermodynamics lab. This will be the electrostatics lab. Uh, this will be the magnetic force lab. And uh, with the circuits, actually, that one I plan on basing a lot of it on, um, on simulation. But uh, I might just show you something about the oscilloscope so that you know what the real thing looks like uh, for anyone doing um, research in either physics or something related to electrical engineering. Oscilloscope is the tool of the trade in that, well, hi, oh, oscilloscope is the tool of the trade in those areas. And um, it's good to have some experience with that. So, um, but uh, the, the circuits lab, the two of them, uh, that one, those ones will have more simulation component in it. Um, so yeah, that's a kind of all the lab overview.